So this evening we're here to talk about Ellen Atsui and the wonderful uh, metallic wall scul sculptures that he started making about 10 years ago. These are beautiful artworks. I can't say enough about how impressed I am with them. He's an extraordinary artist. The exhibition is wonderful in the scope of materials that he has, that he has control over. It just astounds me every time I see it. But specifically, we're going to be talking about the wall sculptures tonight. But to set the stage for what I'm going to talk about, I'm first going to talk about the North Carolina Museum of Art. And just so you have an understanding of what I'm going to say tonight, I'm going to kind of step through the history of the project that brought me to my research that I'm talking about tonight. So I'm going to talk about the first installation at the museum, the problems that we had, realizing that I needed to go to other people that had already experienced this, talk to them, and then try to come up with a better way to handle this artwork. And then we'll talk about the second installation at the museum, and then uh, we'll have a, a little discussion about it. So, moving on, here's the North Carolina Museum of Art. Now, this is actually our West Building, the newest building. It opened up about a year and a half ago. And in the foreground here, you see our director, Dr. Lawrence Wheeler, saying hello to the thinker who is on loan. He's not one of our art pieces. But this is the building that actually brought in our Ellen Natsui sculpture. It was commissioned for this building. This is a, an architect's rendering of what the museum looks like at night. Here we have the West Building here. We have the old East Building here. This is an outdoor theater. And this is of oh, two acres. It's plunked in the middle of a 160-some acre park that's also part of the museum. The exterior uh, uh, objects, sculptures, look a lot like this. All sorts of different artists, different uh, uh, shapes, sizes. Uh, this is actually a real little girl. But I love, this, I love this picture. I had to put it in there. I just like the picture anyway. And, I, and, and the reason I'm showing you these, and, the, and also the next slide, is just to give you a feeling for the wide variety of artwork that, that conservators and art handlers have to deal with on a daily basis. The wide variety of materials, as well as the size, all that sort of thing. So I'll just point out one or two here. Uh, particularly this one in the middle, I think, is particularly interesting. This is Chris Drury's work. It's called Cloud Chamber. It looks like a hobbit house, a little hut out in the woods. But when you go inside, you shut the door, and it's pitch black, and there's a very small hole in the roof, which the building is actually a camera obscure. It projects the sky on the floor, and that's what you're seeing here is the sky on the floor, and especially on a cloudy day, seeing those clouds scoot across the floor, it's, it's really kind of a surreal experience. On the interior, we have over 700 objects in the West Building. And we are, our collection covers from uh, some 5,000 years of art history, uh, from ancient Egyptian, classical Roman, old masters, right up to contemporary works, as well as a lot of ethnographic works like this beautiful African flag. So there's a huge variety of artwork that, that passes through the museum. And of course, one of the, the main reasons to have a museum is to preserve artworks. Of course, we want to uh, have it there as long as possible, generations hopefully, for the public to, to enjoy. We are a state institution. We are collecting art for the state of uh, the population of North Carolina to be able to study and enjoy forever, hopefully. So, of course, once we get the artwork, it's very important that we maintain it. And that's what the conservators are there for. That's what I'm there for. Now, specifically, I'm a painting conservator. I was trained to treat paintings. I'm what you might consider a bench conservator. I've, I've, I've trained to put my hands on the artwork and do whatever is necessary. When, we talk about, when I talk about painting conservation in public, the first thing that comes to people's mind is restoration. And certainly, that's me there retouching a paint. That's putting paint on a painting, uh, uh, covering up damages. Of course, that's something that I do but it's a very, very small percentage of what I do. There's many, many other things that we do that all come under the heading of preserving the artwork. Uh, th that's really our job, not to make it look good only, but also to make it last as long as possible. Installing artwork is one of the very first things to do to preserve it. Of course, we have the building around it. That's the the environmental bubble, the light bubble, all that sort of thing to give it the right conditions. But if you don't hang it on the wall properly, then you're going to have problems right from the very beginning. And there couldn't be anything much more simple than hanging a painting. You put a couple hooks on the wall, you put it up there, you have a D-ring on the back, you put it up there. But in, that, in actual fact, it gets really, really complicated if you have 700-year-old objects 
you want to have a shelf underneath there to support the whole thing because it's worm-eaten and falling apart in a lot of other ways, and you want to make sure that it's well supported. Uh, something, this is actually a, another wooden panel painting. It's huge and very heavy, and you have to have this lift in the middle, no matter how many people you have standing around it, so you support it all the way up the wall to make sure it's in good shape. You're not cracking it, you're not uh, uh, breaking it on the way up there. And more or less a standard painting, but even that takes a group effort to make it happen. And then just recently, we hung this huge uh, uh, Kende Wiley piece, um, just a gigantic stretched canvas painting. It was the largest painting I'd ever dealt with, a freestanding painting like this. And the thing that amazed me, and thank God we have good art handlers and preparators, is that yes, it had a hook up here in the middle, and it had a hook here and a hook here as well. But when you get it up on the wall, you have to have a ledge for it to sit on right here. Otherwise, the whole thing droops in the middle. It's just such an expanse of stretcher there. So there's a lot to think about, even for something as simple as a painting. If you move on to complicated objects, things that are heavy, fragile, uh, multiple materials, all these other things, it just gets more and more complicated. Uh, just very quickly, this is a, a Nick Cave uh, sound suit made out of these artificial flowers. This is uh, Jaime Plensa's uh, uh, night lights, I like to call them, but they're very large fiberglass sculptures with a light inside that go up on the side of the wall. So there's a lot of variety of things that we have to deal with, and every time we have to call on our experience and our education to do the right thing and handle it in the right way. Now the one thing I'll comment on, all of the artwork that you've seen so far, it was ready and complete when it got to the museum. The artists made the object and we acquired it. And all we had to do, basically, was display it. Maybe put a, a, a D-ring on the back of a painting to put it up there on the wall. Maybe build a base and lift it up and put it there. Uh, but that's, that is the limit of what museum people generally do. Not only that, we try to avoid doing anything else because we don't want to add any new context to the piece. The artist has finished the piece. We don't want to do anything that misconstrues what they were trying to do, what the artist was trying to do. And this is a major departure for the Ellen Etsui wall sculptures that we're going to talk about. Okay? Just keep that in mind. So, here is Lines That Link Humanity. This is our artwork. It was commissioned for our new building, and it came in about a year before the building actually opened to the public. And this was our first viewing of it, spread out on the floor like this. Now immediately, we're, we're confronted by the fact that it's, it's literally not finished. It's finished as far as the artist is concerned, but here's where the collaboration comes in. The finish is by the owner your, itself. The owner of the piece takes this sculpture and hangs it in any shape, in any fashion that they care to do. Folds in it, creases in it. Uh, pleats, maybe you put something under it, maybe you drape it over something, and it changes every time you move the piece. That's one of the beauties, one of the wonders of this piece, how it can change every time you put it in a different place. And this is something that the artist is very much a part of. He loves this, he intended it this way, okay? So, before we go to the next slides to talk about the first installation, I want to hand around a few samples, okay? Now these, I made these, okay? <laughs> and I use, I use the same techniques that Ellen Etsui and his, his, his workers use as far as the metallic pieces. You, you'll see on the back there are some whole uh, liquor uh, wine bottle lids. This was good quality wine. I'm told the screw tops do come on good quality wine. So I'll just have to say that, that, that I, I'm working with the best here. So, um, so these are actually uh, my creations. I used his techniques, but then I just used my own thoughts about what made a good pattern and that sort of thing. But I want to point out that, that they are metallic, they have rough edges and pointy bits on them, and they will poke a hole in you if you squeeze these too hard and whatnot. Uh, and I, I purposely put them in these plastic bags. We're going to, uh, they're kind of like a prophylactic for art. They're, we're going to uh, <laughs> practice uh, good, safe art handling tonight, okay? Uh, but some of you may be brave enough to open up the bag and put your hand in there and, 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 and touch it. And, I, and actually, I want to encourage you to give them a little bend, tug on them a little bit, and, and, and wrap it around a little bit to, to get a feel for what this material is like. But I have to say, it's at your own risk, okay? I, I just want to point that out. So here we, here, here we go. <laughs> here we go. Okay. 
and I encourage you to, to, to keep circulating them around all for the rest of the evening. Let me catch up on my notes here. Okay, so, so here is uh, some slides just showing you part of the process. Of course, we start out with the, uh, the tops themselves, and uh, we have to cut them. You cut the side of it, and then you cut around the top to get two separate pieces. Then you use the hammer to flatten it out. Uh, there's lots of rough edges here. I'm, I'm wearing protective gloves, which is interesting. I, I, I do encourage you to come see the Fold Spindle Crush. Fold Spindle Crush? Fold Crush. Fold Crumple Crush film. I have not seen it myself but I've seen some stills from it. And I think it's really interesting to see the people working with these pieces. How they have any fingers left after doing a few thousand of these, I have no idea because it, it, it's really hard on your hands. And then the process of, of cutting the little short wires and putting it together. And, uh, and actually putting it on the floor, I saw that as well looking at pictures of um, um, Ellen Etsui working. They make the pieces in, in, in batches, basically parts, and then they, they move them around, they put them on the floor because that's an easy way to see the thing and move the parts around. So I was trying that out for myself. And the one thing I'm trying to point out here in this slide is how different the flexibility can be because of the way it's put together, okay? So on, on these two, on the ends here, and the same pieces here, the long pieces side by side make the piece relatively stiff, right? So when you go to put it up on the wall and you're trying to put shapes in it it, 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 it fights against you. It's hard to put certain kinds of shapes in there because of those wider uh, sections. But then if you look at this piece on the end that's made out of the short, small pieces, it just slumps right over the end of the block here. And, that's, and, and it shows how flexible those particular areas can be. So the, the piece, especially a very large piece with a lot of variation through it, it really has a mind of its own. It's only going to let you do certain things. So it, once again, th there's a collaboration going in on here. Ellen Natsui has created something, and he's given us the power to shape it the way we would like, but the piece has a mind of its own. It's almost like a third party of the, of the collaboration. Okay, so now we're back to the first installation. And um, we have the large piece on the floor here, and we prepared the wall. Now I have to say, um, going into this, we felt pretty confident because, like I just showed you, we had a huge variety of artwork that we deal with. There's a lot of experience in our museum. Uh, we talked about it a little bit, and, t and, and I was just uh, one of the uh, uh, privates in this, you know, one of the lowest of the low. I just showed up as a pair of hands, and you'll see there's about 13 of us, 14 of us that showed up that day. We were just told to show up, and the head art handler and the curator were the main people that had kind of planned this out. And the curator was the one who had related the most information from the agents, Ellen Natsui's agents. She had also met Ellen Natsui, and she had already kind of gotten the word as to how to do this. And we were just supposed to show up the man, manpower and woman power and put this piece up on the wall that day. So we all showed up, and the wall had been prepared. So we have uh, three boards up here. These boards have uh, nails about a half an inch apart like a comb sticking out, okay? And that was supposed to hold the whole weight of the whole piece on the wall through the whole process. And these pieces down here were just some scattered pieces of ethophone. This is a sheetrock wall. Uh, some scattered pieces of ethophone that were just placed here and there. And that was really intended so when we went to the sculpting stage to the ma making the shapes in it, we would have something to put a screw or a nail into that was kind of soft. And also these pieces project out a little bit to give it a little bit of shape. So just to reiterate, that, the, the, that dark wooden strip at the top was supposed to hold the complete weight of the whole piece. Now the piece is 18 feet high and 25 feet wide and it weighs about 125 pounds, okay? So here we are carrying it and uh, at this point it's kind of rolled up and it's on a big piece of plastic and there's uh, like six or eight or almost ten of us carrying it through the hallways. It was about at this time that it acquired the nickname The Beast <laughs> because it was, it's rather large and it, we felt like we were rescuing a, a porpoise from the beach or something. <laughs> as we're carrying it through the hallways. But the fact is, it's too long. If, we, if it had been its complete length and say on a tube, like we're going to talk about later, a rigid tube, it wouldn't go through the hallways. It's, it's too long to turn the corners and go through the elevators, that sort of thing. So you, you have to keep it flexible like this to get it through the hallway. 
The next thing was we placed it at the bottom of the wall and we started unrolling it, pulling it out slowly but surely. And as we did, almost every five minutes for the rest of the day, we said, this isn't working quite right. And we had to stand back and think, okay, now, now how are we going to make this better? And we would brainstorm for a minute and then we'd try again. Eventually, we did get enough of it unfolded that we started handing it up the wall. Then the stair towers came into place. We had to roll those over and have people stationed up there to hand it up to the next person. Now, it's amazing how 125 pounds doesn't sound like very much. Maybe four people in here together can easily raise 125 pounds. But we had 12, 13 people there. And when you're handing it up to those four people on the tower, it weighs 1,000 pounds. It's amazing how <laughs> being in an awkward position, it gets very heavy very quickly. And eventually, everybody's there pulling it. And it talk about taking a village. I mean, it took 13 people a half a day to put this up on the wall. And this is just getting it there, OK? Getting it up on the wall. Then once we get it on the wall, the, the shaping begins. And you had to grab big pieces of it and heft it up. And someone else had to get in there with a nail or a screw and, and, and anchor it to the wall to, to keep these shapes. And the shaping process, the, the major part of it happened over a couple of hours. But then over the next month, two or three of us would go in the, with the curator and change it a little here and a little there before we were finally, until uh, the curator was finally happy with the shape it took. And I have to say that this process is, could go on forever. You're never finished with it. You just, uh, anybody who's an artist here in the, in, the, in the audience today knows when is it finished is probably one of the hardest things for an artist to figure out. And somebody who's a curator or an art handler who may not be an artist, this is a new experience. The idea that something could never be finished and you just have to walk away from it, it's a new concept that you just, it's very hard to, to, to understand. So here it is in its finished state. And you can see it, it has a lot of shape. We call this aggressive sculpting. And, um, and, and, and actually, uh, it, it, was, it was very popular. People loved it. And this was the first hanging because this, our buildings were already closed, but we had to put it up to photograph it and to show it to the board and, and let everybody see it before it went into the new building. So this was really considered an experimental hanging. Now, um, uh, once we got it up there and, and, and we walked away from it, I, I just wasn't happy at all. No one was really happy with the process. And, and to kind of quantify it, I'd say that maybe well less than half a percent of the piece was ad adversely affected by bent pieces of metal, uh, broken wires, so a few bits fell off. I mean, think about that sample that we're handing around. If you took that sample, it's, it's easy to hold and flop it around. And you don't really feel like you're damaging it, but like tie a bowling ball on one corner of it and then flap it around. What do you think is going to happen? The wires are going to start pulling away, and that's exactly what happened here. And I started thinking about it. It's like if you were going to, uh, to move your uh, Monet or your Picasso or your Van Gogh, and you were going to lose a half a percent of it every time you moved it, would you be happy with that? No, not at all. And I do have to say, none of these paintings are in my museum, just, just so you know. Uh, so, so at this point, I realized, OK, this, this painting, uh, excuse me, this artwork is going to come off the wall in a couple of months, and we're going to be putting it back up a couple of months after that. And I think we can do a whole lot better here. So we had a few ideas already how, how we could improve things. But I knew that there were other people out there uh, in other museums who had dealt with this a lot more than we had. So I, I, I thought, well, this is a good time to go talk to my peers and, and, and gather some information. So that's exactly what I did. Uh, now, before I talk about learning from others, I just want to talk about a few of the issues here, okay? A few of the issues that I see with dealing with this particular work, this type of work by Ellen Sui. The first thing is, is that these are found materials. He, he, the first thing he did, the first time he did this, was he picked up a bag full of these on the side of the road, thinking, this is really interesting, but I have no idea what I'm going to do with it. Took it back to the studio, and eventually, he figured out this way to make an artwork out of it. And, uh, and they got bigger and bigger and bigger, as we'll see in a minute. But they're found materials. These are liquor bottle tops that had already been bent and stepped on and, and you know, messed up a little bit. So they had acquired some history. And in, in, in art history in general, there's plenty of precedent for using uh, found materials, materials that have a life of their own before they come to the artist. Robert Rauschenberg at the top here. Uh, this is actually our Rauschenberg here at the North Carolina Museum of Art, which is a quilt 
uh, on top of some other things, which I think is so similar to what we're seeing with the Ellen at Suey uh, wall hangings anyway. Uh, Marcel Duchamp, famously a bicycle wheel. Uh, the same thing, Picasso, bicycle seat and handlebars. It just transforms these objects that already have a history, gives them whole new meaning. Uh, up here, the Way Way piece I think is really interesting. This is a profile of Marcel Duchamp, and in here are um, uh, sunflower seed husks. And I, I thought that was just a great image. And then Calder, of course, is a great example because he makes this wonderfully patterned uh, 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 fish, very much like the Alanette Sui. And when you look at the details, it's little fragments of cups and glass and seashells and all sorts of things. So here we see you know, artists using old materials. Now I have to admit, I think many people in the museum world, and many of you probably, can see that if you have a pristine artwork, something that's made by uh, Leonardo da Vinci or something like that, uh, you would handle it differently, I think, than a piece that is already kind of rusty and falling apart and, and already has a lot of scratches and things like that on it. It's, I think it's just kind of a natural reaction. But the fact is, is that once an artwork comes into the museum, we are supposed to freeze time as much as possible. Nothing should change about that artwork that we can possibly keep from changing. No matter if it's pristine and new and shiny, or if it comes in dingy and scratched and bent up. That's the way it was made by the artist, and we try to preserve that. We don't want to add new scratches and damage just because it already has some scratches and damage. The next thing is, is that the artistic process uh, is a whole different thing than what museum people do, okay? Ellen Atsui has this incredible facility with many, many, many different materials. And like every artist, the artistic process is building, taking things away, putting them back, destroying things, putting them back again, and getting to the point that the artist is happy with the object. You can see it on several objects in the exhibition, but I want to point out these are burn marks. He's actually burnt the wood, okay? He's destroyed it. And destruction is part of the artistic process, and it's, that's the way it should be. But once the artwork comes into the museum, as I've just said, that has to change. That has to stop. When you deal with a contemporary artist, though, and you're dealing with these Ellen Sui wall tapestries, Ellen Sui has, has, has um, spoken to his own agents. He's spoken to the owners. And when he speaks to you, he's speaking to you as an artist. He's continuing the creative process. And when he comes and actually puts the piece on the wall himself, if you invite him to do that, he's continuing the artistic process. So if he wants to take a screw and put a brand new hole through the piece, that's, that's all up to him. If he wants to step on it and, and yank it and bend it a few times as he's putting it up, up there, that's all up to him. And that's a wonderful part of the artistic process creation process. But if it's given to me in my museum and he's not standing there, then I'm going to put it up and, and treat it as kindly as possible because I'm not the artist. I'm trying to preserve the piece. And I think this is the crux of the problem that many, many people have had with these sculptures, is that you're, you're trying to do both things. You're trying to do what the artist has asked you to do and, 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 and be part of the artistic process, but at the same time in a museum setting, we preserve things, and, and this is really kind of rubbing together and, and making the situation difficult. And the last thing I'll point out in these slides, and I'm sorry the quality is not better, is that on the bottom here we have his workers moving two pieces to be displayed. So here's a group very much like you saw in our first installation at the North Carolina Museum of Art, a kind of group effort putting this up. And they're probably doing the same thing we did, bending some pieces, breaking a few wires, all that sort of thing. But like I say, they're working for the artist. That's part of the process. And then here, you have w one or two guys pulling this huge piece that looks like a fishnet. I'm sure this is probably a very weak uh, sculpture, the way it's made. And they're just dragging it across the ground. I mean, I can just imagine the pieces popping loose left and right. But once again, they are part of the art artistic process. This is not the way I would handle it. So the other complicating factor is, like I say, when he first started making these pieces, they were relatively small. As he got better at it and more interested in it, they got a little bigger and a little bigger and then really, really big. And as we've already pointed out, if they're small or even three feet by three feet, they're strong enough to hold their own weight. You can handle them with no problem. But once they get over about 10 feet on a side, 
There's enough weight that they pull themselves apart just by lifting it up, okay? And when they get 30 feet high, you cannot handle them without damaging them, period, okay? No matter how careful you are, you're going to damage it a little bit. So the whole idea of trying to limit this as much as possible is important for a conservator like myself. Oh, and the last one, even bigger. Oh, I was, I, the other thing I, I, was, I was commenting on there. He's been making these pieces for about 10 years. The first ones that were made, generally people hung them like a curtain. They just put them straight up on the wall. They might have a couple of the kind of natural folds in them, but that was good enough. Everybody was wild by that. Within a, just a few years, people started tweaking them. They started putting a little bit more shape in them, and then a little bit more shape. Until now, just like you saw with the North Carolina Museum of Arts piece, the sculpting is very aggressive, okay? And all that handling contributes to the stress. So here we are, learning from others. Uh, I called a number of different people, but I'm only going to highlight three here. Uh, the first one was Kirk Christian, the head preparator at the St. Louis Art Museum. And they were one of the first groups to really handle a lot of these. And so you see some of the key things that he suggested here. One is, is that um, they lay the piece on the ground and they have this wooden lattice work that's about half the height of the artwork. And they slide the artwork up on top of it and they attach it temporarily with uh, uh, zip, line, uh, zip ties and not you know, wires, whatever that, that is handy to, to attach it. And then they, then they use this frame to support the top of it while they lift it up on the wall. So, so this is the idea of spreading the load. When we had that comb at the top uh, for our first installation, all the weight is on one line all the way across the piece. On something like this, you want to spread the load as much as possible all over the place, all the many, many, many points of attachment. And so by making this grid and attaching it to the back, that's what you've done. You've spread the load. You've spread the distress on the piece. So that was one of the major things I got from Kurt. This is uh, from Mark Milani, at, uh, Chief Prepared at the Nelson Atkins Art Museum. Now they had a similar sort of approach, but you can see they have a gigantic piece. See their little head sticking out here? Uh, this, is, this is twice as big, probably, as the one we had at the North Carolina Museum of Art. And they, once again, they have moved many, many of these pieces. And the, the, the innovation that I got from them was this boom across the top and the lifts on the side. So basically, they have the piece on the ground here. You can see the, the lifts with the boom across here. They have the piece on the ground, and they attach this boom to the top, passing a wire all the way through it, and then they lift it with the boom all at once. And they've done things at the bottom to try to relieve some of the weight as it's going up the wall. So I thought that was a great idea. And you can see they've only got two or three people working, so it's, a, it's certainly better as far as manpower goes. And the, uh, another group that was very, very helpful was the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And here we had uh, Christine Giantini and uh, uh, Kendra Roth, both conservators, who helped me out in this respect. Now they've taken, they have uh, three of these at the uh, Metropolitan Museum, and this is the largest one. And it's, it's uh, I wish I'd put a detail in because um, the way this, is ma this one's made is very fine, small parts, not the robust, thicker parts that you might see in the, in the bags that I'm passing around here. And so this one is, is really quite delicate, especially for its size. And uh, so they did several things here. One was they, they, they didn't have a single track. They had a wider track, spreading the load at the top, the, the number of attachments. They also had almost like sailboat rigging, where they, they had this uh, rod at the top, with little pulleys here that were attached to this piece at the top that they could slowly pull up. Also, this is, uh, um, it's basically already attached to a backing all the way down. Now this is a textile conservation trick. Any of you have had or seen um, uh, family quilts from 100, 150 years ago? Oftentimes you would go into some small historic museum someplace and they've just taken the quilt and, and like wrapped it over a rod or something that's hanging down. Well, the problem is within 20, 30, 40 years, just the weight of the quilt with all those old fibers, they're breaking constantly, and the thing is tearing itself apart just from its own weight. So the trick to do with that is you tie it in many, 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 many places all over the surface to a stronger fabric underneath that's invisible when you have it hanging up on the wall, so it supports the whole piece. That's how you avoid that damage. 
And that's what the Metropolitan Museum of Art has done here. And at the bottom here, I'll show you, this is exactly the same piece, just two different hangings. And once again, this is the earlier hanging, and this is the later hanging. So here we get more of that aggressive sculpting going on. So, after having talked to these people and, and several others, we had a much better idea about how to go about doing this. And we fully intended to use that grid that I showed you. I thought that was a wonderful idea, but reality stuck its head in. The reality was that we were moving into our brand new building. We had over 700 objects to put into the building in about a three month span. And although this was one of the biggest and in some people's mind the most important, we couldn't slow down and put the time and the resources into building this grid. So Tom Lopez, our head art preparator, came up with a new idea, which coincidentally was very much like the boom that we saw from the Nelson Atkins Museum. Our first job was to take it down. And this is the process that's already on the ground. But the reason I have this slide in here, here is our boom. It's actually a paper tube about this big in diameter. And it's stretched between two lifts. And um, that's how we got it down. And you'll see uh, the, other, the, the process going back up in just a minute. In preparing the wall, here's our wall in the new building. And the interesting thing about our wall here is it's a floating wall. It's not attached on uh, three sides. And uh, we, uh, like I say, the piece was commissioned for this wall. But the piece itself intentionally is several feet bigger in both directions, okay? So when it goes on the wall, we actually have to sculpt it, compact it, accordion-like, to fit it on that wall. And on that wall, we've completely covered it with ethafoam, a dense white foam that's about this thick. And here you see the foam butted up to each other and these fender washers that anchor the foam on the wall. The process is we have the artwork at the bottom here, we take the boom and we put it down here as low as it will go on the machines. We lift it up, put it over top of this, and we take about four or five feet of it uh, overlapping the top. Now that's enough weight that it holds itself on there. We barely have to keep our hands on there as we're lifting it up. That spreads the load, that, that takes a lot of the weight off of it. We get on the stair towers, we keep our hands on it, we lift up the boom with the machines, and we get the bottom of it, of the artwork, at about this place that we want the, um, the artwork to be when, on the finished product. Once it's there, then we push the bottom part of it against the wall, and we start putting chopsticks through. And you'll see this in just a minute. Once we have the chopsticks all holding the piece on the bottom, then we lift up the top, and we put the chopsticks through up there. Now, this is just getting it to the wall. And this is the uh, chopstick part happening right here. Now, what do I mean by chopsticks? I mean real chopsticks. <laughs> and we used about, oh, 150 of them to hold the piece up there. And it's strictly just to hold it up. And chopsticks are wonderful because they're long, they're, they're very obvious, you can see them, no problem. Uh, they're, they're relatively soft because they're made out of wood. One of the problems with all the other systems that have been, been used is that they use nails or screws to anchor the piece. Now that's great if you're just putting it up there. But if you're putting it up there and then moving it all around, the nails and the screws get lost very easily in the piece. You can't find them. They're small, they're skinny, uh, they're very hard to see. And as soon as you start moving the piece, you're pulling against those nails and you're ripping holes in the piece. So my idea was use the chopsticks. You've got plenty of holes between the wires and all that sort of thing. You can see that in the pieces that I'm handing around. The chopsticks fit in there very well. They go right into the ethafoam. And you can move them all you want. The ethafoam actually seals itself up when you pull one out, and you, so you don't have to worry about leaving a hole. So the chopsticks work wonderfully well. We put them about every two feet, top and bottom, to spread the load all over the place. And as you can see on the end, the art handler was very happy with the way this went up. The first installation, 13 people all morning. This took maybe two hours to take it down, put it back up, and we had four or five people working on the job. It was dramatically better as far as manpower and time went. Now the piece is up there on the wall, right? And this is what it looked like just up on the wall, which I think is really interesting. I like it that way. And I think I'm going to kind of go back towards that the next time that we reinstall it. Uh, and, and, and so the sculpting process starts. And that's what we're doing here. We're still, you, you release uh, an area by taking the chopsticks out. You push it around, get the shape you want, put the chopsticks back in there, and then move to another area. And there's a lot of standing back saying, oh, that looks good there, but I don't like that part. And you keep moving it, and you keep moving it. 
And that's why I have three versions here. This is all the same piece, of course. And this is what, how it started, and this is how it ended up. And you can see there's an intermediate piece here. There are many, many interme intermediate stages. I'm just showing you one here. And like I said, there's a lot of standing back, just figuring out what we wanted it to look like. And uh, it's interesting to see it this way, but when you see it from the side, you see how much it's standing out. There are plenty of areas on here that are standing 12, 18, 16 inches out from the wall surface. Um, it's very, very mountainous looking. And actually, Ellen Natsui has told us that it's a little too busy for his taste. <laughs> but, but, but part of the problem, once again, was we intentionally made the piece bigger than the wall. So all that material has to get compacted onto the space. And I'm thinking of ways to get around that in the future. And then, of course, once we had the shape that we wanted, we systematically went back and replaced all the chopsticks with clear rods. Here are the clear rods. These are extruded acrylic. You make a point on one end so that they'll go in very easily. And we had very, very little short ones that work great when the piece is right up against the ethafoam and the very long ones if we needed to uh, uh, support some of these areas that are sticking out. You can even see some parts that are sticking away you know, this much above the wall. And uh, we, we did that by long acrylic rods, uh, sometimes crossed back and forth. But even then, the piece would slide down every once in a while. So we took some copper wire, scored the rod, and, and, and wrapped it around there, and then tied the piece to the rod to get it to extend out beyond the edges of the wall. So here we are. Uh, this is the first time and the second time, just to compare the shapes and that sort of thing. And once again, I'm putting this back up there just so you can find the article if you care to. And um, here are the other contributors that I wanted to mention. Uh, uh, Kenzie Kachka was the, the curator during this uh, phase with, with the Ellen Sui. Unfortunately, she's no longer with the museum. Kirk Christensen from St. Louis Art Museum. Kevin, Kevin Etherington from the Smithsonian. Christine Giantini and uh, Kendra Roth from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Kellen Hack from uh, the Hood Museum at Dartmouth, um, Tom Lopez, Chief uh, Preparator at the North Carolina Museum of Art, Mark Milani at the Nelson, Nelson Atkins, and Rachel Rayner from the Fowler were all contributors to the research here, and I want to thank them very much. And that's the end of my talk for this evening, but I'm glad to talk for a while. I've dusted it several times. Uh, one of the things I didn't comment on was when I replaced the chopsticks with the clear rods. Remember, I used about 150 chopsticks. I used over 700 clear rods. And I probably could have got away with three or 400, but the reason I put 700 in there is to support it well enough that I can dust it. And also, if, if we have a, a trip strip on the floor to keep people away from it, but inevitably people step across it and want to touch it, people are so attracted to it. So I, I, I've supported it well enough that I can literally take a very soft brush and brush the surface and vacuum it lightly as well, uh, just for that reason. And we do, we, 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 we tend to dust it about three times a year. And it's held up very well. And sure, it, every once in a while it moves around a little bit, but that's not a bad thing because we're going to change the shape eventually anyway. So. That, that's a good question, and I can't answer that specifically because uh, I think the curator... The minute we walked in, that's the orientation that we first put it in, and that's the way it stayed in our minds. It's, it, it, I'd be interested to go back to the curator and ask her, was this intentional? Is this what Ellen Sui said was the top, or did you choose it, or how did that happen? Uh, so that, that's why I can't answer your question. But the fact is, is that it, it's, uh, it can be turned on its side. It, it, it can be trailed on the floor much more than it is, because supposedly, the artist really isn't concerned about that. That, that it, the collaborative part is we can do anything we want to with it. Now, following up on that, I'll have to say it's interesting that, that that's the premise, that it's up to the owner any way you want to. But if you hang it up and then you invite Ellen Sui to, to give his opinion, <laughs> he's going to change it some. I, I've had both stories. I've had people tell me that he walked in and saw the piece and said, love it. And, and walked away, and then other, other time he said, no, it's terrible, I gotta change this, and I gotta change that, and, <laughs> and so, you know, if you invite him to, to be part of it, he's going to be part of it.
Yes, uh, you mean from a conservation standpoint? Yeah. Yes, but, but I say that meaning that light is always an issue with everything. Light ages everything, period. Um, uh, I think in, in the grand scheme of things, the, the, the liquor bottle tops, the, this, this kind of metal that it's made out of, is, it's, it's relatively strong as far as light goes. It's not going to fade too dramatically, but some might fade more than others. It's just the fact that some, some types of inks, some colors, are more fugitive than others. And so, inevitably, you're going to get some fading at some amount. But I think, in general, it's a relatively robust material, and it will, it will do okay. One of the interesting things that was, that was mentioned to me by uh, Kendra Roth, Kendra Roth is an objects conservator at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. She knows these things much better than I. And she pointed out that this is a mixed metal piece. Okay? So the, so the lids, the tops, are made out of one metal, a white metal. I don't know what that would be. Probably aluminum to a certain extent, but there's probably a lot of other uh, uh, me uh, metals mixed into that to, to create a malleable metal that they can use. But then you're using pure copper uh, wires. And between the two metals, you're going to get electrolysis, I think is the right word for it. And so over time, it's going to make its own degradation products. And variations in temperature and humidity are going to make that even more active. And I, that's about as far as I can go with an explanation because I'm not a metals person. But I, I was told that that's, that's an issue. And, and the only way you're going to avoid that is by keeping the environment as level as possible. So. Oh, I, I, yeah, I would say certainly that's the case. I mean, it's... it's uh, well, one, one artist that's, that's good to point out, and you may have actually seen it in one slide here somewhere or the other, was that in the, in the, um, in the gallery where Elinette Suey's piece hangs, he was told what other artworks were going to be in there with it. And one of those pieces is by Anselm Kiefer. It's one of our signature pieces, a very large work, and it's made out of hay, lead, uh, wood, large boulders covered with lead and wires and then it's burnt on top of that. He took a fire, took fire to it. And um, Anselm Kiefer is famous for not caring that his pieces fall apart. He's basically taking, pieces, taking materials that are fugitive in themselves, putting them all together and, and making an acquired history. He even invites people to his studio to walk on the pieces. He lays them down and says, oh, no, just walk on them. I want wear. I want tear. I want it to feel like there's a history there. And the pieces continue to fall apart. And, and within the conservation community, there's this kind of gold standard. If it's smaller than your hand, you don't worry about putting it back on. And we even, ha we even have a little cup that has kefir bits in it that we just can't stand to throw them away. I mean, it's... It's part of the conservation thing that we just can't throw anything away. So we have a little kefir bits pile that we keep around. And one day we walked out in the galleries and it has this kind of big funnel shape. We call it the witch's hat. It's about this big around and it's a big funnel made out of lead. And it's, and it's, it's, it's kind of floppy, but it stays up there. And we walked out in the gallery one morning. It was laying on the ground. It had finally just fallen off. And we, um, we called him up and it's made out of lead, so sheet lead. So when it hit the floor, it, it distorted it dramatically. And um, so we called him for two years. We, uh, we kept it off the piece for almost two years, calling him and his agent, asking for how to, how to, how to deal with this. And he really wasn't interested. And I mean, and, and we eventually kind of shaped it and put it back on there because it is bigger than your hand. So, but. Bits. Oh, yeah. You can have, you, yeah, you could have your own kefir. <laughs> You can have your own kefir, absolutely. So, so there's an example of an artist that, I mean, he says that that's a living artwork, that, that that's what he expects, that's what he wants, that's what he, he wants you to expect. And so certainly that there are artists like that. But I think that there, those artists are rare. I th you know, it, it's a psychology, um, uh, being an armchair psychologist, I think all artists want the piece to look the way it looks when they quit. And they... It, it, Consciously or unconsciously, they think that piece is going to look that way tomorrow, next month, next year, and 50 years from now, and 100 years from now. They, I, I think all of us live in the moment to a certain extent, and we really don't think that far ahead, or maybe we don't want to think that far ahead. And it's kind of the conservator's 
uh, uh, cross to bear to know that everything changes. No matter what you do, everything is slowly changing and in a, in a very pessimistic way, slowly falling apart. There's just no way to avoid that. And, and like I say, when it comes into the museum, it's like limbo or something. It's not supposed to change anymore. And it's my job to, to try to make that happen.